So we're going to be covering GE Digital's outlook for the industry this year, uh, some new details about GE's partner program and Gray Matters partner program, how we fit in with that. And then we're also going to do um, a demo and intro to uh, GE Operations Hub as well. Uh, just to let you know, too, we do offer GE certified training classes. So if you or, or your team or, or folks you work with are interested, uh, April 25th is our next one. It's iFix HMI SCADA Fundamentals. Um, iFix Advance is on May 2nd. And then we have Ops Hub Fundamentals on June 14th, GE using VBA with iFix on June 20th, and GE Historian Fundamentals on July 26th. Those are all on our website at graymattersystems.com under the training panel. So I'll post that link so you can see those there. All right, so with that, uh, we're gonna kick things off today with a, uh, a welcome from uh, Alan Hinchman at Gray Matter, and then we'll get rolling into our, uh, our presentations. Welcome, my name's Alan Hinchman. I am the Chief Revenue Officer of Gray Matter, and we are excited to have you here today. Even though I couldn't join live, this is by far one of my favorite events that we do uh, across Gray Matter from our Empower Ups um, to everything else that we do is to connect with the system integrator community and to really drive um, an increased partnership. Today, we've got three incredible speakers, all have been longtime friends of mine. So I know you're gonna get some good content out of this some things that you can actually revenue on and make some great money at. And that's what it's about. It's empowering you to do better uh, with the GE platform. So the first speaker um, will be Prasad Pai. And Prasad has been, and some of you guys may know him, uh, Prasad has been the uh, iFix leader for an extremely long time. He uh, spent a little bit of time away from it, but is back. And then uh, Tim Ogden is also going to be speaking today. Uh, Tim is now in charge of all the system integrator programs. So if you're an SP or a PSP, he is the guy. He's been working really hard on putting some great benefit packages together uh, and reasons to be a part of the program. So we're excited to have him. And then our very own Greg Hazel, who is an absolute expert in just about everything uh, with a uh, GE logo on it. But uh, he's going to be talking about some of the things there. This is about you. This is about how you make money, how you drive value for your customers and how Gray Matter can help you do that. So we're excited to have you here. I know Jeremy's going to do an amazing job walking everything through this. If you've got any questions, be sure to put them up. We'll answer those at the end and have a great time. And again, thank you for joining us. Awesome. Thanks, Alan. Appreciate it. And like Alan said, you know, do make use of the questions, uh, the question tab. You can post them in there. Um, we will have time at the very end for Q&A, but I'll also try to squeeze them in between the presenters today. And if you really wanted to get into a conversation, we have a we have a nice uh, tight group today, so we can even turn webcams on and, and have a bit of a, a conversation as well. So just know that that option exists here. You can enable uh, mics. I'm going to go ahead and mute folks for now. Um, but later on, you know, we can we can chat if you want. So first up today is uh, Prasad. Uh, Prasad, welcome. Thanks for being here today. Gray Matters SI Summit. It's good to see you. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. And um, thank you for having me uh, present and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, as Alan said, I probably know most of you. I spent quite a bit of time uh, being the iFix product manager. Um, I've been with GE since the Interlution acquisition. So I've been doing this. This is my 30th year now. <laughs> I'm doing um, automation systems. Uh, and I'm back as the automation leader for GE Digital. So I, I now uh, head the automation team for SCADA Operations Hub, um, uh, Batch, and um, and some of the other uh, initiatives around Config Hub and, and the uh, UAA, which is the security uh, profile for G Digital as well. Um, so what what I'll cover today is I'll I'll give you a, a, a refresher of the 2022 release, the portfolio release that we did uh, beginning of the year, and then uh, look at some of the exciting new um, capabilities that we are working on as part of uh, the automation portfolio as well as uh, as well as the historian portfolio. Um, so let me make sure I can advance the slide here.
Might have to click on the pane first, uh, Prasad, to okay. get it to activate and then use the down arrows, or you can click on the slide directly with your mouse. Okay, give me one. Okay, oh, there, there you, you go. go. Um, so a quick, uh, um, okay. So for some reason I, again, lost. <laughs> Okay, well, so uh, it's I can do it for you. There's <laughs> a de delay there. Um, so, quick thing again, I just wanted to put in uh, the safe harbor disclaimer, um, knowing that some part of the presentation uh, looks at uh, roadmap, which um, you know is is in the works, and and uh, uh, you know although we we have a specified timing as to when we are releasing it, um, you know features may uh, shift here and there. So let me kind of go to the next one. Um, so just a refresher uh, to everyone, uh, we did our uh, 2022 portfolio launch uh, at the start of the year. Uh, what, what we have started doing um, with the 2022 release is we are going to a yearly cadence of what we call as the major release. So uh, every major release of our product will happen once a year. It will be part of this unified portfolio launch. Um, and as part of this unified portfolio launch, we are also looking at certain common capabilities to have um, to work across the portfolio. So when we when we release uh, when we do a portfolio release, things like security, things like install, uh, will which are which are common, and I'll talk about uh, the integrated install capabilities. All of those kind of align to how the portfolio release or how um, a customer needs to install a solution as an example. So we are trying to align all those um, together from an interop standpoint. Um, so this was our first attempt at doing the, the portfolio release. Um, as part of the um, release, iFix, Simplicity, Historian, Plant Applications, uh, Operations Hub, every, every product went, went, through a, uh, went through a release. Uh, we also uh, released some uh, innovative uh, capabilities as uh, either products or as flavors of, of uh, products like plant applications or, or historian. Uh, I'll kind of go into, um, let me see if I can get this, okay. Um, so uh, just to uh, refresh what we did as part of uh, an automation-wide portfolio for 2022, um, when you look at some of our SCADA products, the major enhancements were around um, doing some of the enhancements to the model as, as configuration. We, we now have a enhanced uh, PLC as well as OPC UA browsing capability uh, within um, graphics as well as within the, within the database to create a, a model for, uh, for IFIX and, and create tags. There's expression support now when you when you browse the model uh, for animations within graphics. Uh, what, we, uh, what we also uh, did as part of uh, the 2022 release was uh, integrated our common security layer, which is called UAA, into, um, into IFIX, Operations Hub, Historian especially, so that it's, it's a common security aligned to Microsoft Active Directory if you wanted to align to uh, an active to directory configuration. So UAA takes care of uh, nested configurations in active directories, uh, aligning to active directories with, with the IFIX groups. And it's the same um, same security that follows through through uh, to operations hub as well as as well as historian. Uh, one of the other things that we also did was uh, went to what we call as an integrated install. And this is one install that if you needed to install iFix, Historian, and WebSpace as an example on a single machine, this one install kind of kicks off that, um, um, that SCADA server per se. And what, what we were able to do is where uh, earlier uh, you folks probably spent two to three hours trying to do all, the, all of this installation. Now we have brought that installation down to almost 15 minutes of all the components that you may require on a, on a server. And one of the advantages of, of this is obviously looking at the, at the second point, which is for, for a lot of our customers, there are customers who 
who are um, uh, defining a cloud first strategy or defining a vm strategy for them the deployment has become a lot faster a lot easier as they as they do a cent centralized deployment or push centralized up updates through this integrated install so that was a big big benefit for customers looking at at centralized management there um, and then looking at uh, enhancements in operations hub and operations hub has really gone through an evolution from from when it first came to um, came to market and now it it is truly become a a tool that can not just help hmi scada uh, customers uh, do more decision uh, making outside of uh, outside of hmi scada by by providing different analytical tools but it has also become a analysis tool on top of historian uh, the new trending capability that we released as part of the 2022 um, uh, release of operations hub uh, we've got rave reviews uh, around the trending tool and what it is able able to do um, uh, greg would be uh, kind of doing a demo of some of the capabilities of operations hub as we get towards the later part of this presentation and hopefully you'll uh, you will kind of appreciate to see what we have um, how we have kind of matured that tool in terms of uh, the cap capabilities to uh, provide you for dashboarding or for extending your um, uh, your UI capabilities to users who are not traditional uh, HMI users um, uh, for uh, you know that participate in a in a SCADA network. Uh, in addition to our traditional products, what we also did uh, uh, was there were three uh, innovative releases that we did. The first one being um, a cloud version of our OEE capability of plant applications. And, and this is something, uh, this is a, a lightweight, a faster install, something that uh, customers who, are, who don't want to go through um, the pain of having to install an entire MES or they they don't have the resources to actually go through and, and install a full-blown MES. If they want to um, use a, a MES managed service per se, um, then they can they can use this uh, this particular product. The way I, I look at managed services offerings is this is something that um, you know our, our integrator community folks like you can offer as a managed service as well, and and um, options like Cloud OE provide you the ability to um, you know, source this software from us, but then provide it as a managed service to, to your customers as well. So this was something that, um, that we also introduced as part of uh, the 2022 portfolio release. And then staying on onto the cloud theme, um, what we did as, uh, um, as, as part of our uh, release here, is is also come up with what we call as the serverless historian which is uh, you know having a native cloud historian um, that customers can deploy now and and the way um, similar to cloud oee historian also allows you to provide a a managed historian for your customers um, and, and again this is this is not a historian that ge would host it's not a hosted historian but it is a historian that you can run in a virtual private cloud, whether it's it's a customer's cloud or whether it's a cloud that you would host for, for a customer. Um, it supports all of the native protocols that um, IGS um, allows you to connect to, or it has MQTT interfaces. It, has, uh, it can be deployed and managed through Kubernetes as well. Um, so it has high availability and containerization as far as uh, uh, the historian server goes. And it, it allows you to integrate into an existing data lake that uh, the customer may have, or it, it uh, allows you to integrate into any analytics related um, uh, data repositories that customers may have at an enterprise level. And, and so this was another major um, uh, capability that, um, that we released as part of the 2022 uh, portfolio uh, piece. And the third one really uh, is something that uh, started as an innovation project uh, and um and and what what we were able to do and this was a version one release as part of or you know the first release of this particular capability which is uh, helping you digitize um, the connection between manufacturing product data and by manufacturing product data it could mean specifications recipes routes 
um, any quality related information. Uh, when we started this as an innovation project, this um, the the feedback we got from a lot of our manufacturing customers was the fact was the fact that their factory floors or shop floors were, um, you know, when it came to recipes or when it came to changing uh, product specifications or packaging information, their shop floors were managing this manually they used to get an email to say you know you know there's some there's a change in material or there's a new recipe that has come in and that gets manually entered into any of the execution systems so what orchestration hub allows customers to do is create a a interface between your business layer where all of these specifications or uh, or recipes or any uh, product related information that may exist in a PLM system or an ERP system, and then bring it down in a digitized format and connect it down to your MES systems or down to your batch systems, as an example, or, or send it to uh, send it to a SCADA system. And this particular product now provides that digitization. And, and what we started seeing when this project started was um, a Manufacturers kind of struggle during, um, especially during COVID times when they had to remotely uh, manage some of their production, or you know there was a shortage of labor in terms of how they how they could um, uh, manage the the change in in the product specification that they had to do. They they had to almost on a on a daily or a weekly basis based on materials that they that they receive adjust the the quality or adjust the um, the the product that they were manufacturing i mean if you if you go to any grocery store today um you know you start to realize that the packages we used to buy whether it's uh, uh, whether it's kitchen paper towel or even you know cookies as, as an example the packages have gotten smaller the paper tissues have gotten thinner and some of it is basically manufacturers trying to adjust to the material they have trying to uh, trying to make sure that they are still satisfying uh, demand out there um, for uh, for their products uh, by trying to adjust the the specifications of the product that they that they produce and this has been going on on a daily basis so this product kind of aims at uh, trying to help them manage these changes as they happen rather than having to manually manage this on the on the shop floor so um, so that was the other thing that we did, and then um, getting into this year's what what are we what are we doing as part of automation and historian, especially what what are we working on? So uh, when we think about automation, there are two key uh, themes for uh, for the automation uh, team this year. One is looking at flexible deployment, and again carrying on from the theme of integrated install, um, allowing customers to uh, deploy VMs or deploy uh, a cloud first strategy kind of building on top of that flexible deployment uh, capability in introducing centralized management and looking at how do you encas encapsulate encapsulate sorry <laughs> uh, an ifix project as an example so that you can deploy any changes to the project um, you know backup restore of a, a project or or uh, uh, looking at when you, uh, you know, one of the things we are working on is moving IFIX redundancy from UDP to TCP IP, which now allows you to flexibility, uh, gives you the flexibility to deploy the second backup SCADA server, which could be, uh, you know, rather than having both these servers uh, next to each other, the second one could be uh, in a different location. And uh, TCP IP will allow you to um uh, to have that at larger distances have a formal disaster recovery capability a an option within uh within failover as, as an example so those are some of the capabilities that um that we are adding on the SCADA side and on the hmi side we are looking at how do we add more rapid hmi development capabilities how do we get to a native web um, client rather than having to use web space as an example or how do you get to um uh, you know some of the uh, some of the iot based protocols or interface to iot based protocols so there's mqtt5 support that's coming in um for uh, for ifix and simplicity that will allow you to directly get information from from sensors uh, we obviously added opc ua support so uh, connection to remote uh, remote devices if you wanted to see a responsive hmi will 
um, uh, will be secure as well. So those are some of the capabilities um, that we are working on as part of uh, automation this year. And I just wanted to give you a sample of uh, you know some of the uh, UI things that we are we are working on. Um, and and so you know I, I talked about operation operations hub and how operations hub was was maturing in terms of capabilities it was pro providing. We are utilizing operations hub to to even have a page designer that lets us create HMI screens. And these are native HTML5 uh, responsive design oriented. HMI screens that can run on a desktop, on a on a large TV monitor, on on a mobile phone, on on, a, on an iPad device, and that that's something that we we are working on already. Uh, working on a on a designer um, that will that will help you create these graphics, allow you to in fact consume even iFixer simplicity graphics as SVG into into this environment. So um, so that that will extend the the ability to um, to have pure web clients, and which um, you know, which has been a demand from our customers, not just from a technology standpoint, but just the scalability in terms of how many clients you will be able to run off of a single SCADA server, as an example. And a couple of examples of what OpsUp can al allows you to do today versus what uh, you know, and what it will add once you add HMI capabilities to this. So today you can you can actually um, you know, lay out uh, a graphic for um, not exactly an operator, but a process engineer or a, or a supervisor who can uh, look at performance or who can look at um, uh, get a geographical view of how their assets are performing. And some of these, uh, you know, like the the mapping capability, these are widgets that are available in operations hub uh, today, where you can navigate using that map. You can actually. Uh, you know, click on uh, the the pin on the map, and it will show you information as you have connected it to that pin. And some of these capabilities will come as part of the HMI once we integrate the the designer in there as well. And then, uh, you know, just looking at uh, kind of another example uh, on the next slide, um, you know, just laying out uh, more of a process and uh, analysis graphic that shows you. Um, you know, a quick view of your process versus how your process is performing if you want to do that analysis as well as part of Operations Hub. Uh, and this is something that you can do today. The, the richness of the HMI page building will get added to some of these capabilities as you as you think about it. Uh, and then finally, uh, kind of looking at historian and uh, carrying um, the historian theme forward of, of being cloud native um, what Historian will is working on is is giving customers the ability to have hybrid deployments or um, or basically have deployments that um, uh, that OEMs could have a managed deployment of, of of an Historian for their customers for their assets as an example. Or um, uh, Historian is going to also benefit with the MQTT five uh, uh, work that we are we are doing. And it will have a native connectivity, a collector that can. Uh, it already has an MQTT collector, but will add the MQTT five capability to that collector as well, so it can um, it can connect and get that information. Uh, adding certain, um, uh, you know, we we support. Uh, so historian today, uh, actually, it's it's the only historian that is available on the AWS marketplace. So you could really go to the AWS marketplace and deploy. A cloud historian right from AWS itself. So um, the the plan is to extend it to Azure as well as we as we become cloud independent in terms of technologies. Um, adding more OPC UA context, adding the ability to uh, federate a model and consolidate a model. So when you look at an enterprise historian, it will basically consolidate the fed, uh, federated asset model across. Across your uh, across your installs or across your portfolio, and uh, allow you to uh, then use historian and historian capabilities uh, in a in a model context. So that's some of the um, some of the work that we are doing as part of the 2022 um, release here. So uh, that's pretty much what I had to present. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions, answer any questions you may have. I, uh, Jeremy, thank you for. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, pushing the slides as I was, no worries. Yeah, as I was challenged. <laughs> you know, on that. No worries. Uh, uh, Prasad, is that AWS accessibility for historians? Is that new? And 
it is, that, is it that is. the reason is that people started to take advantage of that yet or yes so that uh, i think it's just been a month that it has been published to the marketplace um and it is a fully deployable uh, historian from the marketplace now so it's just been a month that uh, it went up that's cool yeah, yeah. Well, Prasad, thank you so much. And and uh, like you said, if we have questions at the end, I think Prasad, you said you can hang out and uh, yes. we can we can get to those as well. So uh, next up, I want to bring in uh, Tim Ogden. Uh, Tim, if you want to um, click your microphone, I think you'll be all set. There you are. How you, how you doing, Tim? Doing well, thanks. Yeah, thanks for being here. You can you can take over the slides if you want, or I can try to man them too. <laughs> all right. Let me, uh, there we go, down on the bottom. There you go, you got it. <laughs> all right, well, first uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for taking the time out today. Um, you know, Gray Matter does a good job of trying to keep uh, out in front of things that are happening with uh, GE Digital, and, uh, and it's great that they're uh, hosting these SI sessions uh, to our community. So. Thanks a bunch for the invite. Um, <clears throat> what I'll do is I'm going to talk a little bit about what's new for 2022 as it relates to the program. So um, I joined GE um, roughly six months ago, and my goal is really to expand um, and really drive our SI focus in the community. OK, and that's uh, specific to our solution provider program. Um, a little background on me, I spent about 30 years in automation. So most recently I was over at Briggs and Stratton working on some IOT initiatives for them. But um, my, my roots go back to um, Rockwell Automation, spent about 26 years there. And I too was uh, three decades in. So my original uh, venture was with a little company called ICOM, which we got uh, acquired by Rockwell. So um for those of you i haven't met you know uh, i've been around and i look forward to meeting you in the future uh what we'll do today is really give you a sneak pre preview of the next generation of the program and how that relates uh with you um from a system integrator perspective if we look at the programs for 2022 or what's new. So there's really three things that we're going to be focusing on. You know, there's several new program changes that are in the works and we're going to start seeing more communication starting in May. And we'll touch on a couple things here, but you know, GE, we continue to see a lot of new industry trends in the market. Um, they, they're impacting customers in different ways. So whether it's COVID that's introduced the new business challenges or even manufacturers that you know are starting to focus on circularity, more around sustainability and, and some of the supply chain challenges. So with that said, each one of those trends, you know, has a common element that we see, which is you know, really looking at data and how we transform that data into actionable information. So, you know, as we look at the program expansion, um, we're starting to integrate in. Um, some of the new products, some of the new trends in the market and getting that information out to you. And <clears throat> my goal is really to also start to uh, really focus on the SI competency development. So Prasad talked a lot about new technologies, new things going on, but how can we take those products? How can we educate you, get you up to speed on those changes uh, and share our roadmap moving forward so that you in turn can share that with your customers and service new opportunities. <clears throat> um, so why are SIs critical to you know, GE's ecosystem? I guess if we look at that, um, really number one, strong relationships. You know, the SIs really understand the drivers uh, from the customers, you know, and those drivers are what create new opportunities. So whether it's capacity, quality, profitability, risk, uh, we look to our SIs to really help us understand the pain and the drivers for the customers. Uh, secondly, GE is our digital implementation arm. So uh, if you look at you know the, all the automation products that we've installed out into the marketplace, and I think we've got about 
oh, roughly 500,000 uh, nodes of HMI install out there. Our SIs were the arm that implemented that. So we're very dependent on them to help us uh, continue to deliver those solutions. Um, <clears throat> as far as trusted advisor goes, you know, there's constant product and technology trends that are going on. And so we kind of look to our SI community to help us decode those product and industry trends and then apply it to the customers, you know, based on their manufacturing needs. So, you know, you also are those advisors that kind of assist us on new CapEx, new OpEx decisions. And so you definitely help drive the decision on behalf of the customer as well. And then I think another real critical part is your technology leadership. So um, SIs use the technology and the innovation to find those creative ways to solve complex problems. And they're, you're also helping us find those future products and features and help us drive our new product introductions out as customer pilots as well. So I uh, can't speak enough about how critical uh, the systems integrator community is to GE Digital's ecosystem. Now, as we, as we start to look at um, our evolution, what we're trying to do is, is kind of go from more of what used to be a transactional focus program where, you know, somebody can sign up and get a set of tools uh, to more of a relationship driven program, program that really integrates those SIs into the ecosystem. So if you think of it from a customer perspective, um, we want the customer to see us at one, see us as one entity uh, working together uh, to solve problems. Um, <clears throat> foundationally, you know, we want to do some some key enhancements. So for the last six months, uh, we've been working on enhancing some of our IT infrastructure behind the scenes uh, to align with the new program expansion. And that includes things in Salesforce and, and other areas. Um, you know, with respect to uh, expansion to some of the other systems, as an example, our, our uh, partner locator and our website, you know, we get over 10,000 visits to the GE digital site per year. And so we want to look at expanding that partner finder to enable our customers to really uh, find and locate SIs with the right product knowledge, experience, and industry focus. So we'll add new filters uh, for certified members and start to showcase uh, proven experience. From an expansion standpoint, really what we're looking at is, is driving things into two different areas. Um, you know, number one, we're going to put an emphasis on manufacturing execution and also an emphasis on automation. Uh, and, and depending on what type of systems integrator you are and where you focus, uh, we want to start to showcase those skill sets moving forward. Um, and then really take a relationship driven uh, behavior with our uh, rep organization. So uh, most of you have met and, and leverage uh, gray matter on a day-to-day -day basis, but we want to make sure that they're helping to drive that relationship to the next level. Um, one of the things that uh, we've introduced is, is what we call our SP community portal. And what that portal does is that's, that's really intended to enable you access to all different kinds of information. So it's driven by uh, a tool called Seismic behind the scenes. And what Seismic does is that gives access to, you know, over, you know, 800 different documents, uh, whether it's industry related, uh, to talk about market sizing, what trends are and things like that. But it's really intended to give you access to everything our own GE um, sales folks have access to when you're building out a, a marketing plan or business plan or you need a presentation or you want to look at some customer testimonials. So this is the place that we allow our solution providers to come in and actually get information that can be useful for their sales and marketing campaigns. Um, we talked briefly about this. So another foundational enhancement is really our SI locator. Um, the SI locator, 
what we're doing there is we're going to put some expansion into that. And what we want to do is build that framework so that we have really a focus on the technology segmentation. So we'll start out with automation and MES, and then we'll start to layer in the digital transformation as well. But one of the key things we want to start to do is really drive competency integration. So we've seen an uptick in customers coming to us asking for um, systems integrators with specific skill sets. And so we want to make sure that that tool uh, that we have there is the tool for them to go seek that out. So things we'll be adding in is training achievements, certifications, CSIA certifications and things like that. So keep in mind that as, as we start to build that out, um, I would encourage you to number one, go up and check your profile out to make sure it's up to date. If you do not have a profile up there, you can certainly get that posted uh, and the gray matter folks can help uh, walk you through the process for that. So as we look to the future, today we have a single level program and we're gonna be expanding that out to a three tier structure. Um, those structure is gonna, the structure is gonna have two technology segments. One is uh, manufacturing execution. So for those integrators that focus on MES, MOM and, and some of those type of technologies and then more automation uh, focus, which is more SCADA, historian and analytics. So you'll see some of the data transformation products scattered in both of those areas, but those are the two key areas of focus. And from a relationship standpoint, you know, that three level program is really looking at, you know, what type of relationship you want to have with, with uh, GE gray matter. So number one, if, if you're just more interested in spec driven projects and so you kind of ramp up when you get something specified G GE and more of a neutral approach, that's absolutely fine. And that's what we consider our member level. Um, as we move up, we look at the solution provider gold level. That's more of a preferred uh, GE approach. So uh, you may have a significant install base with GE and their products. So you prefer that product. Uh, and then there's a, a primary, which is the platinum level, which is is really driven by companies that go to market with GE and GE is their primary uh, product of choice. And then they assist with competitive conversion. So each one of these levels will have different um, engagements. It'll have different uh, benefits that come along with that program. Um, if you look at engagement. So what we mean by engagement is, is really the business development engagement. So one of the things that this new framework is going to do is, is really start to develop some tools around, you know, uh, success and mutual action planning, competency, driving success plans and service, service expansion. So as I mentioned before, you know, we've got a significant install base. So the question is, are there areas that we can go help you grow your business with existing customers, with new customers? And what are the skill sets that you need uh, in order to get there? Um, competency is a big part of where we're starting to, to really accelerate. So we're introducing some new um, certification levels, uh, as well as uh, some new training roadmaps for our systems integrators. So you'll be able to get access to those. Uh, some are e-learning tools, some are instructor led, and we're gonna continue to really drive forward on that. So look for more, more uh, events around competency. And then, and really the last is around sales impact. So uh, as we look at those three different levels, what we're all trying to do is mutually grow our own business. And, and so we're gonna take a look at uh, what type of business level is being generated at those. And we have some expectations for each of those levels as we move forward. Um, <clears throat> there, if we look at what some of the cornerstones are for the benefits, they're really broken down into more things around products and architecture. So the program delivers 
all the development tools, access to the technical resources. And the resources are not only GE, but the gray matter resources. So whether it's solutions architects, assistance with laying out a project, things like that. Um, you know, giving access to new innovations, product roadmaps, application architectures and things like that. We want to assist there. Uh, things around competency and knowledge. Business development, we talked a little bit about, you know, a tool that we have called a success and mutual action plan that helps really drive out what the needs are of the SIs and how we as GE and Gray Matter can assist with that. And then, of course, the, the technical support. We want to make sure that we're always supporting you uh, to make sure our projects are successful. So at the end of the day, you know, the program alignment is really about uh, differentiating, differentiating systems integrators and improving the overall experience with GE and uh, ensuring that we're helping to solve some of your challenges uh, out in the, in the market. Um, <clears throat> when we look at a engagement expansion, so I just want to touch on this a little bit. There's a couple of things that we're making changes to fundamentally. So, um, one of the things when we talk about engagement, you know, we don't have to wait till there's a project, right? Engagement can start any time to talk about projects, directions, strategies, and things like that. And that's a two-way street. So while well, we'll try to push um, to ensure that the reps are helping you and assisting you with these plans, uh, we want to make sure that you're taking the time to meet, whether it's monthly, bi-monthly, just to really have conversations on projects, on sales, on marketing and things like that. Um, <clears throat> the expectation is that we're going to be working with our SIs to develop a coal managed objective, you know, and a competency roadmap. So where are we today? Where do we need to be tomorrow based on the trends in the market? Um, we're going to be doing some things from an engagement standpoint. So we internally are changing a little bit on how we uh, work with the projects out there. So we use Salesforce to identify our opportunities uh, for our end customers out there. And now what we're going to start to do is engage and make sure that for every opportunity, we're putting in an SI that's going to be engaged for the deployment of that opportunity at the end customer. So starting to ensure each one of our opportunities is tied off with a systems integrator. So that's going to be a big change for us in the future. Uh, we call that a key player assignment. Um, <clears throat> when we look at where we're going to head, you know, Prasad talked a lot about the portfolio, the roadmap, um, and where we're heading. We, there's, there's, there's really four key areas that we focus on from a theme with regards to the platform. So circularity and sustainability, a ton of activity with our customers. There's a bunch of industry drivers that are impacting this in manufacturers today. Um, smart manufacturing and lean, uh, improving the way we manufacture. Uh, that's a big uh, goal of ours to really continue to drive that. Uh, Enterprise-wide operations, which really is is working with manufacturers to embrace data transformation. So uh, the motive to get more information, get more visibility, understand, you know, their process continues to grow. And then the other one is really that, that connected worker. So the right information to the right person at the right time. Um, you know, these, these initiatives are all supported by the product enhancements then and new products that are being released that Prasad talked about. So really, as we look at, hey, what are the key areas of focus? So what's our message to our customers, to our market? Uh, these are the key things that we're focusing on. And, and finally, really what I want to just make sure we continue to harp on is the, the whole digital transformation capabilities and competency. So our goal is really to continue to enhance your skills and really take you down the journey to make sure that we're leveraging everything we can 
um, with Historian, with Ops Hub, some of the analytics tools, the reports out there. So, you know, historical data storage, whether it's on prep cloud or hybrid, there's a demand for it. Um, and, and really what we want to do is, is try to figure out how we help our customers create that single pane of glass or, you know, single version of the truth when it comes to manufacturing and operations. So look for more e-learning certification, WebExes, uh, and things like that uh, in the future on these topics. So action items really are three areas. You know, number one, um, learn about the program when it launches. So we're about two weeks out from uh, starting to push the program out the door and, and start to educate everybody on that. Um, the second item is really how, how to leverage the digital transformation tools. I think Greg's going to do some demonstration on a few things, but, you know, what are your customer demands? You know, do they have all the information they need to make educated decisions, right? Uh, can they see what they need to? So that digital transformation uh, strategy for them is, is very critical. And then, you know, develop your 2022 competency roadmap reach out to your gray matter uh, sales rep, talk a little bit about what uh, training courses are available, whether that's one-on-many WebExes, whether that's uh, working with us to do a one-on-one -on -one update with your company on what's new in 22. Um, let, let's uh, sort of lay out a, a strategy and a framework to go do that. Great. Tim, thank you so much for that. We, we do have a question here from Steve, and I, and I want to uh, give Greg a a chance to share his screen. Uh, so Tim, the, the question is, so on the partner levels, based on business volume item, how does the program address the situations where, you know, an SI specs the, the platforms, components and service support contracts, but then the client procures these items for whatever reason, you know, such as they have a volume purchase agreement with GE, or they think they can buy it cheaper and they can, you know, eliminate the middleman, the SI. Can you kind of speak to that? It's also in the chat too, if you want to read over sure. that question. <laughs> you know, I, I can talk a little bit about that. So okay. what, what we find traditionally, so the, the program today offers discounts and, you know, by going through your gray matter rep and placing that order, they would typically extend your discount based on what your level is. Now, <clears throat> from a customer standpoint, what I can tell you is, you know, they really, they really don't have any advantage to buying it direct. But what we do find is a lot of times the systems integrators aren't that interested in taking title, uh, purchasing on behalf of the customer and then deploying it out. So a lot of times we don't even see them leverage it. Um, one of the things that we do is we, we still want to recognize um, the fact that the systems integrator was a part of uh, helping get that decision made. And that's one of the changes that we made in the system. So when an opportunity goes in and let's just say it's for ABC corporation and, and somebody from gray matter puts that, that opportunity in the system. One of the new changes is that when that goes in, uh, we're going to be asking them to identify who the systems integrator is that's going to be working on that project. Now, the customer may have somebody they're going to use. Mm -hmm. uh, and if that's not the case, uh, we can recommend somebody for them on their behalf. And so we're going to be putting that into the system, which will help us uh, get visibility into um, a lot of the projects that the SIs are working on. And that will help us better understand you know, and provide incentives to those SIs. Cool. I'm not sure if I answered it completely. But... <laughs> well, it's a complicated question, so we can we can yeah. get more into it too. Um, you know, at another time. But Tim, thank you, thank you for the presentation. That was a, a, a ton of info to go through in a in a short amount of time. I know, so I appreciate it. All right, Greg, uh, welcome. Thank you, Jeremy. How are we doing? Good. How are you? Very fine. Good to have you aboard. Good. Okay. Um, sharing my screen here. What I'm going to do is show you uh, a little bit about how we integrate um, iFix uh, pictures, uh, what we call mimics, into Operations Hub. So I'll give you a quick demo on how we do that. 
Uh, there's been some questions coming up from customers over the last month or two, so I thought it'd be a good topic. Um, what I'll start off with here is we'll just build a simple iFix picture from scratch so you, you can um, see how that's done. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, but I just grabbed a couple dynamos here and I'm going to build uh, a little uh, iFix display using our food and beverage demo that's part of the iFix 2022 release. So I'm actually just integrated into that. And what we're doing is we're just dropping down a couple uh, dynamos, a few tanks here on the screen, uh, assigning them to, to tags. So I have a, a juice tag, a slurry tag. So we'll go ahead and change this guy to slurry here. And uh, also, if you're making juice, it's made up of uh, some juice concentrates, some slurry, and some sugar. So we're going to have tanks of all that stuff. Um, the goal here is to the goal here is to uh, publish this into uh, Operations Hub. So the first thing you do is you actually build it in iFix, and um, it will publish the uh, graphical dynamos, the um, JPEGs, and things like that that you have built. And just putting a little pump down here tied to a, a status. So this is all in the iFix environment. The, uh, the tools that you can use to publish are right here. Use the WebHMI toolbox. And the things that will you can create with the WebHMI toolbox will publish into Operations Hub natively. Okay, so what it's going to do is convert it from an iFix picture to a JSON file. And that is something that Operations Hub can, can run. So um, we're just building out a little content to show you what that looks like. And, um, and then we'll uh, publish that in the iFix. So things that won't publish. So, you know, obviously Operations Hub is HTML5, Java environment. Um, it will not run Visual Basic Script or ActiveX controls, things like Alarm Summary Object or the Trend Object. Uh, but Operations Hub has native objects that do exactly that. So I will show you that as well. Um, once we got that down, I'm going to go ahead and uh, put down a couple of data links here and show you how that works. So for data entry, um, we'll stick down a data link, one for our auto manual switch. And we're going to go in and make it in place data entry. Uh, we can set our justification of our data link and drop that down. Um, I'll go ahead and duplicate that here real quick and we'll put a little control action on here and we'll tie this to our uh, status tag. Again, in place entry is set and so I'm able to do control with this. If you go into animations and you see that the object is selectable and highlightable, that means I'm able to go in and actually interact with this in Operations Hub, meaning if you want to be able to change set point or do control, these two check boxes right here under uh, animations, right click animations. If they're checked, then you're, the user's able to select them in Operations Hub. If you don't want people to do uh, control changes, simply uncheck that and they won't be able to interact with it. Uh, once that's done, I'm going to go ahead and just save that picture. And of course, it's just in the regular iFix picture. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. And you can see that I could go in here and turn that pump on and off um, through the operator interface here. I got some values updating, and that's all there is to it. Um, Okay, so um, once I'm in here, uh, I have my juice plant running right here. And uh, once you're in this environment, you can go ahead and publish the picture. And you do that under the publish button right here. And then you um, go through your... Um, your list of pictures. So these are all the pictures in iFix, right? As a as what we uh, been creating, and then you go in and hit publish. You put in your credentials because this will actually publish 
to the remote operations hub machine. So I'm on a VM. I have two VM ones running here. One is in iFix and one is in uh, operations hub. So two different VMs. So you, you, do, you do this on your iFix machine, your operations hub uh, server can be running remote. Uh, you have the credentials right here to point it at your operations hub uh, server when you get set up. So it's asking you where that uh, operations hub server is, the name, the connection, the username, and the credentials to get into the operations hub. So you don't have to do it all on one machine if you don't want. Um, so that's all there is to it there. Uh, once I'm in that environment, I'm going to go over to my operations hub virtual machine and we'll just fire up Operations Hub from scratch. And um, this is the, when an Operations Hub installs, it gives you a shortcut right here. And if you look at the shortcut, it's gonna be uh, your, your server name with an IQP on the end of it. It will switch to UAA because what it's gonna do is authenticate me. So that is not your shortcut. Your shortcut is the one with IQP. I have, I have that coming up quite often. Uh, so this is the Operation Hub designer environment, and I'm going to go in here. We'll just add a new app to our Empower Up 2022 and um, create that app. And then I'll add a new page to that app, and we'll create our uh, tank farm here. We'll create a, a tank farm page within our app. And so I have a, a app called Empower Up 2022 and Tank Farm. Uh, within it, the first thing you're going to do is go into displays and um, probably go into your layouts and drop a couple containers down. And this will help you lay out the operations hub environment. So with the containers, I can change how many rows and columns by selecting the visualization. So maybe I want, I'm going to make this uh, six columns wide. And once you have your columns set up, you can break those columns down into different portions of your screen. So what I'm doing is deleting a couple of these columns. So now I have 60% of my screen here uh, associated with the left-hand side and 40% over there. And it's a good idea to stick a container within a container when you lay these things out. Uh, it's easier to arrange things and actually it controls the responsiveness when you're in an iPad environment. Uh, once you have that done, you're gonna go under your integration menu. And under integration is a series of new widgets. And uh, one of those widgets is the GE Mimic card. So I'm gonna drag the GE Mimic card on and this is just a placeholder for the Mimic card. It's not the actual uh, graphic that you're using. Uh, once you have that down, you're going to configure the Mimic. And that's pretty simple. If you're just going to use this without using the equipment model, all you need to do is go in here to Mimic Name under the properties of this widget and hit manual. And what it's going to do is going to give you a list of the mimics that are available. So there's the one I just created here at the bottom. And what it's going to do is, is hard code this mimic to this name. I could certainly make a global variable where I could pass on the mimic name. So if I wanted to add buttons to switch out the mimic with inside the same frame, I could do it that way. Or I could use the equipment model. I'm going to say save to that, and um, I'm going to go ahead and open that up and run it. So here it is running, and hopefully, yes, I got some data coming in, and I got my juice juicing and my pump running. I can do control through here, hopefully, with this pull down. Now it will give you in-place data entry where I could actually start and stop the pump. You get a little message up here that it wrote successfully or not. Um, it is um, it is running uh, automatically in iFix with some scripts, so uh, different things are going on behind the scenes and put it in different modes and whatnot. So you can do control through it. It does update. The way this data is coming to the screen is through an OPC UA connection. So it's a secure OPC UA connection. 
You need iFix version 6.5 or 2022 to have the publishing capability. You need at least iFix 6.0 to have the OPC UA interface uh, work. So this is done running 2022 here with uh, with both. Um, so once I have that done, I can go into my display and let's just uh, dress this up a little bit. We'll put a little header on here, uh, maybe style this a little bit with a uh, with some uh, custom colors here. I pick. I usually pick Jeremy's favorite color, the gray and the white here. You know it. Yeah, and. Um, and we'll give that a little title right here. All right, so um, you can change the font size and whatnot, depending on what you want to do. Uh, so we got that going for us. Uh, we'll also introduce in the uh, integration widgets, there is two alarming options. We have the alarm card and we have the alarm count. So I'm going to drag that alarm count on there. And what that's going to do is give me indication of the number of alarms I have based on the severity. So I'm going to go ahead and save that one more time. I'm going to go into my, my second tab. I usually have one tab for the designer, one tab for the runtime environment. So when I just refresh this, it will bring in my new updated page. And now you see I have my alarm counts. I have four severe alarms. Uh, six medium priority and so on. And I have my uh, uh, system updating down here at the bottom. All right. Um, in addition to that, I could go back and build a new page and we'll do this. Uh, maybe we want a full screen uh, alarm summary or something. We'll build a summary screen for us and go ahead and create that page. So now I have two pages. Within that, again, I'm gonna use, I like to use the containers in case I wanna adjust, adjust things. I'm gonna go ahead and we'll do a full screen alarm page as well. And that is under uh, alarm card. Just simply drop that in there and you're good to go. Uh, one of the couple of the properties you can set on the alarm card, which makes it pretty nice is you can control the columns. Sometimes there are some columns that you don't really want. I don't want to see my data source or my uh, couple things here that are really associated with uh, some of the configuration. I'm going to get rid of that and hide that. You uncheck auto hide. You can also change the number of alarms that you want to see on the display. And what that does is it controls the length of the alarm card. So let's go ahead and save that. And uh, I'm going to refresh. As soon as you have two uh, Ops Hub pages built, you'll notice you get a navigation menu here, one with the tank farm and one with the alarm summary. So now I can quickly navigate between those two uh, widgets. And uh, we're good to go there. Um, other thing that you might want to do is um, use the... Um, uh, historical analysis widget. This is another uh, widget that we have. And uh, what this allows us to do is trend things. So I'm going to go in here again, drop down a layout, drop it in there, and then let's go back into our integration. Frankly, all the, all the newer widgets and probably the cooler widgets are under the integration selection. So if you're under display and can't find what you want, check under integration and there's a series of uh, selections for HMI, um, general display, uh, charts, and so on. Uh, under general, there's a GE trend card and I'll just drop that down. And now I have a trend card associated with that. And I'm going to go ahead and save that guy. And now you'll see I have three different pages built, my historical analysis, my trend. Uh, for navigation, you can actually control the navigation. You can slide these up and down under the navigation selection from your tank farm, your alarm summary, and your analysis. You can also go in here and select an icon. This is actually pretty useful uh, so the user knows that, hey, 
that looks like maybe a home screen. This might look like an alarm bell. And this one might look like a uh, trend or something. So as you go through, just put a little icon on it. it. Really does help a user out when they navigate in the in the run environment, and that way can see. Okay, let's go ahead and refresh our display one more time, and you'll see that we have the nice icons here. We have our uh, page names, and within the navigation, if you have a page name that's uh, you want user friendly, you can actually have it different than your actual page name. There's a way to do that right in the navigation bar. And so you're able to navigate between your uh, Ops Hub pages, your alarm summary, and then your trend card right here. So that's a couple cards we got going. A um, couple things I'll tweak here. I'm going to go back into our trend card. You notice that was only three quarters screen. You can go into your trend card and uh, change the height right here. Just go into manual for your height and put in your percentage. You actually put in a percent sign here. So the trend card height, 90%. Save that. Good to go. Um, so now we have our trend card set up. We can also integrate uh, some native widgets with inside the Operations Hub environment. So a couple of the new widgets that we have here are the uh, spider diagram. It's a pretty cool little widget. Um, gives you a little spider diagram, so three dimensions or so to show you your tank levels. And what I'll do is I'll connect those to our historian by selecting historian and then selecting the corresponding tag. So I have my juice tag, my slurry tag, and let's go ahead and we'll pick our sugar tag because we do have our three tanks and there's our sugar tag. Notice that when I select that, it says select them, selected items three. And so when I drag this and bind this to the uh, widget, it's going to create the connection, create the query for that. You'll see a data has been bound successfully. And it will create the query for that widget of those three tags. From there, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back over into the uh, Ops Hub environment here and configure this guy. So I select the widget, and you can give it a title if you want. You have selections for your lime colors, your uh, sizing and whatnot. Um, we'll make our lime color not black. How's that? And then uh, your min max ranges. You can change the width of this uh, widget. And then you have to tell it uh, your series name. This is my uh, maybe my inventory here. And you can, again, put a color around it. You can actually have multiple series, which means you can display uh, multiple groups of data. And then we're going to add labels to this guy right here. And we're actually going to fill this guy right here with a little checkbox. So we'll fill it in. And our labels is when we're going to display. You know, this is going to be uh, my juice here. And we'll give it some engineering units. It's going to display in the order that you selected for your tag. So I picked my juice tag first, and then I selected my slurry tag. And we're going to put one more. We're going to stick our sugar tag in there as well. And uh, sugar tag, and we'll stick the engineering unit. So they can all be uh, different if you wanted. Okay, so go ahead and save that guy. We'll see what we come up with. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, go back to my page right here, and I'll refresh it. And lo and behold, we have our spider diagram showing our juice levels based on our sugar levels and our slurry levels, so three-dimensional um, widget. Uh, showing you all that inventory. Um, 
as well as your uh, trend widget over here. The trend, trend widget, if you haven't used that before, most of the configuration is done in the designer environment. So that's where I would go into configuration, select the hamburger here, and then in here, I can either use existing tags from an asset model, or I could just browse the historian directly, which will keep it simple for this demo here and add a couple tags here to your system. And once you're done with that, you can uh, save it as a favorite here. and add that to your system. So now you have that in your trend card. You can look at statistics mode. Uh, when you're in the, I believe, historical mode, you can uh, import and export uh, via this guy right here and print it. I'm going to go and uh, since you have this, um, since you have this um, mode here you can hard code this to the chart itself if you go back to your chart if you want that chart always to come up with a particular favor favorite you can go into your trend card and under selected favorites put that in manual and then select the um, favorite that you want so this will bind the favorite automatically when the page opens, if you want to do that. So I'm going to save that. And then we'll go ahead and refresh our page one more time. And we have our tank levels. You see it automatically brought that up for us. We could go to our HMI display, our alarm card display, and to our uh, trend display. Um, one more thing, you can actually um, notice that each app, if I go to apps and I hit preview, each app will have a QR code with it. So if you take that QR code and just grab that, I'll just grab that QR code here and copy it. And we'll save it as a QR code here. I'm going to save that, and what we're going to do is we'll stick that right on our tank farm display. So if a user wants to get wants to see where that is or publish it, uh, there's actually a widget here that lets us display images. We'll drag that on here, and in the properties of the widget, you can go under, you can display a URL, which means you can go to a URL for a file, or you can go directly to a file that you just created. So I grab that QR code right here. We'll make that left justified and uh, we'll save that. So now when I go in here, the user would go into the main display here. Uh, you should have a little QR code associated with it. Now, Jeremy, I'm going to try to make an attempt to actually uh, open that on my iPad. Okay. And the way we're going to do that, we got the iPad right here. We're going to turn on our camera. And um, I'm going to take a picture of that. And it is going to ask me to open it in Safari. And... I am going to attempt to share my screen here. And you should be able to see my iPad now. Looks like it's coming up. Yep. All right. So um, got some calendar invites here and put in <laughs> my credentials. And I open it up, and there's the display that we just built here. And nice. we've got our live data running. 
And um, so it's really nice with the QR code, you know, no more lengthy uh, URLs and things like that. There's our historical analysis trend and whatnot uh, display in the iPad environment. Um, so works. you can stick that QR code right in your sticky note on your favorite machine and take care of everybody that way. That's very cool, Greg. <laughs> yeah. I liked that the iPad worked too. Uh, two, two questions, Greg, and, and if folks have any uh, last questions, you can uh, hit the uh, raise your hand icon. I can You can enable your mic. You can even ask them live since we have a, a, a good group here. Um, two questions, Greg. So when you uh, changed it from you know stop to start there, are you, do you find that most clients are actually you know using Opsa passively or like actively to actually make changes in the system? Because I've seen both. Yeah, good question, Jeremy. Uh, my experience is everybody asks for the capability to do writes and control through the uh, HMI type screens on the iPad. And in reality, very few people uh, use it. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you, you, you know, I think it. I think you start maybe if there's some apprehension there, start as read only. And right. then as people get used to the technology and uh, understand it and maybe uh, put some um, security around it, um, you can then add some right capability. And again, you know, this, this um, environment is not to replace every um, screen that you have in iFix. iFix has a ton of capability in terms of animations and scripting and, and all that stuff. And it's very responsive. Uh, but this is fantastic. Hey, do we have people in the field, you know, operations people looking at this, you know, as as they want to know their tank levels and where their problems are or even monitoring alarms? You know, a lot of people use the Win 911 notification. They get an alarm. Well, now they really want to see what's going on in the process. They want to see a trend. Right. They want to see what their uh, equipment is doing. So just giving them those, that view capability, mm -hmm. I think is a huge benefit. Absolutely. Um, another good question about a specific part that you presented. Um, are the severity symbols changeable or hard coded? Can you use the numbers for priorities instead of dots or do they are they simply part of the image? So when you're talking about alarms, I think. Uh, yes, the alarms are... Um, the alarm priority are set as the ISA 18.2 standard. So the alarms have severities associated with iFix. Mm -hmm. And they're actually, uh, so what you do is in within the iFix environment, you would change the severity of an alarm uh, tag. So if I perhaps looked at uh, maybe one that I, I have here. Uh, what you do is you would change that severity and then it would be assigned differently with inside operations hub. Um, the severity is based on, I believe it is based on the alarm and event server. And I believe you can under applications, uh, OPC UA configuration, uh alarms this is so it's the opc ua configuration is how you're relating the ifix alarm priority to an opc um, 18.2 um, alarm standard so to answer your question yes i think if you change it <laughs> here um, you would relate them differently to what's displayed in operations Hub. Cool. Well, Greg, thanks for answering those questions and for the demo. I appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. And the and the iPad. That was a cool extra too. That That's, got I got that yeah. going there at 8 30 this yeah. morning for you. So. Yeah, it's awesome. Um all right. So I want to thank everybody. Greg, thank you. Prasad and um and also Tim, thanks for joining us. And thanks to Alan too for kicking us off today. Uh we appreciate it. And to everybody who joined us today. Thanks. Check us out at graymattersystems.com. If you have any follow-up questions, you can reach out to me. I'm at jboren at graymattersystems.com. That's J-B-O-R-E-N. And I can connect you um, with uh, the right folks. So, uh, Greg, everybody, thanks for being here today. And we'll see you at the next SI event. Take care. Hey, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for attending.
Thanks, Thanks Prasad. Thank you. Nice Thanks, job, Thanks, folks. Thank you. Yeah. Bye-bye.